How's it going, everybody? This is Dailies to Downloads. My name is Chad. With me is Eric. No hat this week. What no did hat. you say? Full pandemic mode this week. That's true. We won't. I won't shave until we get a vaccine, which hey, may be coming soon. But but I mean, I need to take the vaccine before I shave. You know, so <laughs> that might be a while. We'll see how far I go. So this week. We are going to do another movie challenge, and this, in this case, Eric challenged me to watch a movie. It's, again, a movie that neither of us, I guess, had seen before this, but uh, it is called Smooth Talk. So, Eric, what made you choose Smooth Talk? Uh, it was a movie that I was not really aware of its existence before maybe two or three months ago. Um, like, may, I don't know. I'm thinking, like, maybe... Uh, when I was watching the film the other, the other day, like an image like would pop up and I'm like, oh, this feels familiar, but it, it, it's probably not. Uh, but it was making its uh, revival, I guess, if you will, on the festival circuit uh, earlier this year. Uh, and that's typically due, in this case, due to a new restoration uh, through like Janus Films. And it was part of the New York Film Festival's uh, revival section that they do every year where there's new restorations of, of classic and, and, and un, underseen films. Um, and this one, some people I knew were, were talking about it pretty highly. Um, also because it's, because of the pandemic, it was all, New York Film Festival was pretty much all like virtual screenings. So a lot of people were watching it uh, at home. And so with that comes, you know, screenshots and people taking video clips and things like that. And, and, and people really like the film. And Joyce Chopra, who is the filmmaker, is, it was primarily known for documentary films in the past. And Smooth Talk was her first feature. Um, I believe she only made another one or two fe uh, narrative features uh, after this. Um, so it was, it was intriguing to me. I think Laura Dern is, is somebody who is um pretty like rightly praised i guess now in terms of like uh she's very very respected she just won the oscar last year right for marriage story um so to see an earlier work of hers was interesting and, and that was without knowing anything about it that's initially uh what piqued my interest and and and, and they've announced it now for Cri to come out on the criterion collection uh early next year so all, all these things combined Plus, the little synopsis that I read was intriguing enough to to dig deeper. Right, and yeah, like you said, it will be released in on Criterion, and I think January, right? Um, yeah, sometime in the early early next year. Yeah, January or February. Um, so yes, as you said, it's directed by Joyce Chopra and uh, written by Tom Cole, based on a short story by Joyce Carol Oates, which is called "Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been?" And it stars Laura Dern. Treat Williams, which for years I said Tret. <laughs> really? But apparently it's called Treat. I, hey. Tret? I mean, I, I, I don't know why. Like, I don't know why. I just was like, no guy be, will call himself Treat, right? But that, hey. that would be so cruel of the parents naming him T R E A T and not having it pronounced Treat, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, well, I like, guess. You have to like correct someone every single time. Like, oh, God. <laughs> So yes, he's in it. Mary Kay Place, Levon Helm, musician, and William Ragsdale, who at this point didn't have a big career, I guess, but would go on to be in lots of different things. Yeah. And yes, as I said, it's based on that short story by Joyce Carol Oates, um, which was also, which itself was inspired by uh, the Tucson murders committed by Charles Schmid. And the movie is also based on director Joyce Chopra's documentary short documentary called girls at 12 and where that documentary follows three girls everyday lives for about six months and i guess according to the imdb trivia like several moments were replicated in smooth talk to establish connie's character as a typical teen teenage girl i don't know that i would go as far as to say moments were replicated yeah when i, I, when I watched I, it looked like certainly that there were certain moments in the documentary that were used as inspiration for like maybe scenes set, like staging, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. But these girls in the documentary are 12 and Connie is most certainly not 12. At no. least, you know. I, I believe, I haven't, I haven't seen the documentary, but I believe they may also interview parents in it as yeah. well. 
which may also factor into some of the dialogue that comes into play in Smooth Talk. Right. So, you know, when I was looking up the plot synopses of, of Smooth Talk, like I didn't really like any of the summaries because a couple of them just basically told you what occurred in the final phase of the film and the other ones pretty much told you everything that happened. So, I mean, I would say this movie basically shows you what it's like to be an adolescent girl, a teenage girl who's, you know, realizing that she likes boys as, or as it's described in one weird summary, uh, you know, her sexual awakening, you know, which, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, you know, I, hey, in another episode, Eric and I will talk about our sexual awakenings, right? That's but, true. I mean, it, it was mine was watching this movie. Yeah. yeah. It took me all these years. It's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, it follows Laura Dern. Her character's name is Connie. She is a typical teenage girl. She gives her parents attitude. She, you know, talks to her friends and goes to the mall all the time. And, you know, that's what she does. It's a very ordinary teenage girl you know she kind of slumps around their farmhouse she doesn't want to help out that sort of thing and we'll get to the final phase but i'll just start out like well eric what did you think of it before i get to my own thoughts you know yeah. because and i should add we're going to get in we're going to have to get into spoilers here at some point but yeah i mean and not and not that it's so um like you make a good point about reading the being un, unsatisfied with some of the plot descriptions because in in a way it's not necessarily such a plot he heavy movie you know like right no uh, not at like all it, it, not like a you know b happens because of a like it doesn't really unfold that way and, and in fact a lot of people have have spoken spoken about the the short story and also the film uh as, as like is it somewhat obviously there uh, is like some kind of allegory to some of it but the way things transpire it also feels a little bit as like is this really happening is this not really happening it's a, you know, so, it, there, is what this you're bringing up is the most interesting part of this for me yeah i mean and, but, but to, i guess like yeah to not even go that far yeah like i think it's also interesting in the sense that um it, it had to me like this very anachronistic kind of feel in that it takes place in 1985 when it was filmed yeah but it feels like of a 20 30 years prior to me uh in a, in a lot of respects not the mall scenes obviously that you know it's but the things like her having the james dean posters everywhere and and some of the dialogue which is probably a little bit more frank than it would be back in a 1950s film there, there is something about it that feels a little of like a of a earlier time to me um mm. and and even some of the uh the way the some of the men dress and, and s yeah some of that just feels like very of a of a like greece right like a, of that kind of time period american graffiti time period maybe like rural 80s you know yeah yeah and even like you mentioned the house even the house feels very decrepit and old right and like um you know the paint is I almost liked that part of it. Like it was an it, it's an eighties movie, and I guess you know, did they ever say specifically what year it is? But I mean, it's no. I, I mean, so. I, it, it's set in the eighties, I guess. But like, it's it doesn't immediately scream at you. Oh, just to remind you, here's eighties fashion. Here's eighties music. Here's eighties set design. Like yeah, yeah. It 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 feel like like you were saying, parts of it feel old. You know, the guys. They have rolled up sleeves, which you know, Eric and I'll bring that back. The yes. rolled up, the rolled up sleeves, you know, that's that'll that gets all the ladies' attention. <laughs> but uh, it, other parts of it are dated. There, there is a homosexual slur that's used at one point, yeah, uh, which obviously does not age well. But uh, yeah, you're. I mean, yeah. it is it is weird in that it seems like a different time frame than what it is. Yeah, like yeah, to, to me, and I don't know if that's also somewhat due to having the short story being written in like 1966 i think right and maybe some of those elements just come into the film as a re as a result of that you know um and, and even like the interactions that i think one of the more interesting parts of the movie too are connie's interactions with her immediate family and like her her sister feels like an entirely different 
person, uh, yeah. you know, of course, yeah. and also from a different kind of more obedient, you know, the woman is obedient and, and it's, you know, it, it, looking over magazines with her mom and doing as her parents tell her and doesn't right. have any, um, any um, rebellious nature to her. Um, you know, and, and yeah, even like the, the, the father character, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure how else to really describe it. It just, it just felt a little, uh, different, you know, and, and not, not in a bad way. It just, it just felt almost of its own, um, own world, I guess, you know, yeah. like, I think, it, I think there is something to also being, yeah, like you said, that rural farm-like environment, uh, you know, like not a, not every neighborhood in the '80s was, you know, Breakfast Club. Definitely, you you would <laughs> yeah. not you would not describe this as what we would call an '80s movie. You right. know what I mean? Like it, it right. is, but as right after she finished filming this, she Laura Dern filmed Blue Velvet, which is also quote unquote an '80s movie that doesn't feel anything like a 1980s. You know, it feels <laughs> right, uh, and has similar uh, pathos in other ways of of coming of age. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought that stuff was really interesting. Before the whole third act and, and all that stuff, um, it, it, there is something a little alien about it that I thought was really yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I would say overall, and part of this, we'll have to get into that third act, but overall, I, I, I liked a lot of what I saw. Uh, the first half is really there is no like plot to it. You're just kind of watching Connie live her life and have her issues with her mom, which is a very it's a really good portrait of what it would be like to raise a teenage daughter. You know, the good times and the bad time, the moodiness. One minute she's doesn't want to do any have anything to do with her family, the next minute she's all happy about spending time with them and the you know the sibling you mentioned who's the exact opposite of her which for a while i didn't realize that i, I guess the, that sister's older yeah when they for a while i did not re i didn't think that at first yeah because the, you, for, most, of, story yeah, most, the most of the time you see the sister she's sitting down yeah so like i thought that she was younger at first but you know not that that matters but um so where the film really gets just, interesting. Sorry, just to add to that one point yeah. about that, because the, also a reason I thought that Connie was the older daughter was because I thought that the mother was resentful of Connie because uh, she also, it's implied, like had a child out of wedlock or, 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 right. or got married because she got knocked up, right? I mean, that's the implication in one scene, yeah. uh, which causes her to smack her daughter in the face. So I thought that she resents... Connie because uh, you know she had to change her life because she got she became pregnant um, right which is not the case I assume I guess but that's I, I thought the same yeah. right and so you see Connie you know getting together with her friends and they want to flirt with boys and Connie eventually goes away and has some you know make out sessions with with a couple guys and all this leads into the third act which has a character coming to her house and you met meet this character earlier you see him around and he pulls up to her house and his name is Arnold Friend and it's etched there on his car and so that's where it goes now I don't have to spell everything out for what happens there but she has an encounter with this gentleman this stranger and I think that a lot of the, when I was re looking at some critics reviews, a lot of people like this. This has a 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 74 on Metacritic, which is, which are both really good scores. But the people that don't like it, the main thing that they say about it is the fact that it feels like two different films. And I can't say that I disagree with that assessment. Now, overall, I liked it, but I do think that that third act is, see, is really different. Now, one of the things people talk about with the short story, as I'm sure Eric looked up as well, is that people are divided on whether or not to take it literally or to take it as an allegory. And before I read that, 
I didn't read anything about the film before I watched it, but when I saw it, I took that third act as an allegory. I immediately, immediately, I, I was like, oh, wait, it switched. Like, what's this? This is different. I was like, wait, how's this guy know all this information? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, but when you read interviews with Laura Dern, even now, a lot of people take it literally is 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 like a an examination of what happened between them and did something happen to the girl did did it not and you know and you know not to go into too much detail but obviously after she returns home like clearly she's a little bit different you know but i i took it i took it you know as as an allegory like there was like sort of a uh biblical devil type situation going on there because in my head if you were to say to me well you got to take that literally to me it all crumbles because there's no way this guy knows all that information as just a regular joe schmo on the street yeah like to me but hey you know uh, so what did what did you think when you saw it um i I mean, I kind of take it. I hope this is not like a cop out. Like where I'm like, well, I I can I kind of see it as as both in the sense that I believe that she did go with him and something transpired. It, a lot of it is, it, it, I mean, mostly it's all implied, you know. It, you yeah, know, and it does kind of leave it open for interpretation it does. to a certain degree. Um, but I also think that that the whole essence of that character is is meant as a I, 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 it's like the, the film in a sense feels like a little red riding hood and there's this pursuant right. fox if you will and while yes there's a huge shift in that third act you at least for me like in the first hour i still felt like we were leading to something sinister like something was gonna something bad may happen just because right. because of that kind of like laissez-faire attitude of the first hour where I'm like, well, this has to be building to either, like, there's going to be a, because uh, we've seen other films, like, um, I mean, very, very different, but like things like an education or other kind of right. films where in order to come into adulthood, you have to be wronged or something bad has to happen to you in order to to get a clear clearer perspective on life and, and growing up. Uh, we, I mean, there are thousands of those kind of stories, right? Uh, so I was anticipating that the way that we, like you said, we see this Treat Williams character, like, you know, in the periphery of certain moments, and he'll say a line that's a, like a, a corny lyric. He right. Says, I'll be watching you, and I, I assume Sting is going to pop out, you know. With the, <laughs> you know? Um, and and th there are some shots where the... The, the two girls are in the restaurant together and they go to like the jukebox or the cigarette dispenser mm. and like we're, we're outside of it looking in as if we're from the POV of the Treat Williams character or somebody. Which I love that shot by the way. Yeah like we, and we don't and it's never really addressed but you just kind of feel it so that so that's why I was kind of anticipating like something bad is going to happen. Right um, and and right. that's why I, that's one of the reasons why I liked it. Now I'd say a lot of the some of the critics that didn't use that as a reasoning I like, you know, you can't have that third act have as much impact of it as it does without the first part. You know, you get to know yeah. Connie and her character. So I understand why it she did, why she made the choices she did, that, that being the director. But I, I still feel like, even though I, I still feel like there's definitely a shift in tone or approach. But having said that, like the attempt was made to kind of merge both of them into one meaningful piece overall. So yeah, and it's definitely like I I because watched it on a on a computer. Like I was, that that sequence was like eighteen minutes. Yeah, on the porch, you know, which is cool because you don't really see that in in movies in general, and especially in this one where the scenes are like a minute here, a minute there. This one's an eighteen minute essentially two people dialogue there's a yeah. wingman slash maybe bodyguard or, or whatever uh also there but um it, and the way they can just like in in camera in one shot they'll kind of separate the two by a screen door or um by a staircase she hides behind a staircase you know and and, and like it was always very um like i was i was totally into it you know what i mean like right. it, it definitely felt like uh and because if you do have knowledge about the Tucson murders as well, 
maybe I was thinking that this guy knows all this, you know, banal information because did he murder this, uh, you know, or like, did he go by this barbecue that her family's supposed to be at and, and do something harmful? Why is he bringing up this old lady who's dead to right. her? You know, there are these things that are meant to be obviously, I guess, disorienting. Right. Uh, um, and, and, um, and, and that's, and I, and I felt really disoriented by the end, but because like you said, like Connie, uh, has a entirely new perspective about right. um, with her family, and it's a, a, and so does the mom. I mean, the mom becomes somewhat of a different person too after this barbecue, and it, it, it seems to be quite a shift. And um, so, yeah. So I guess and, and that, that's what I mean by I see it literal and allegorical. Yeah, like you can look at it in different ways, yeah. and that's that's one of the things that makes it interesting. And you know, in general, I I, I kind of just looked at it as like a sort of you know, well, was there an assault or was there not? I looked at it in kind of a, well, the Connie character gave in to temptation in a, yeah. in a very general, broad sense. You know, she was told to be careful with these guys. We had heard her talk in scenes like she likes when the boys are nice to her and how she wants to be held and all these kind of things. And so she was... The first time you see her, she's just making out with a guy. The second time, she's with a guy who's a little bit more aggressive. And then, the, you know, the third time was that final act. And so that's how I looked at it. I looked at it as like, okay, she has a choice here of whether or not she's kind of going to go over the edge or not. And in a broad sense, it looked like she did give in to temptation and go too far. But as we've just yeah. talked about, you could look at it in many different ways. Yeah. And yeah, typically in, in like horror movies and stuff, right. It's you, you lose your virginity, you're deflowered and then you have to die for it or something. And so right. I thought we may be going there like that, you know, in, right. in, because there's a danger, a real danger of possibility. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, I, there are many ways that um, when she does come back home, uh, the Arnold friend that, street williams character like drops her off like far enough away from her house and where her family is so i'm like right okay so nobody else can see this guy is this like is this sixth sense like like is this right <laughs> is he real That's, yeah you know and things like that because he's not really addressed by anyone else and i'm um, right uh in the, and in that sense um people have many different theories of their that he has these three uh the code yep the i was gonna get to that car. yep I didn't even, I mean, I was not smart enough to even really think, think that through any more than just... I registered it when he was talking about it, but then afterwards, I really didn't think much of it. And then when yeah. I was reading up about it, people were, I guess, they all debate on what it means. I don't really think it matters yeah, <laughs> like, it, it, in the big scheme of things. I don't, yeah. but... It's you brushed know. over, and I'm sure it's there are things to sink your teeth into if you want to. If, it, if they spent any more time on it you'd probably hear me kind of harping about like, okay, they're trying to be much more intelligent. They're trying to be like really intelligent and mysterious and enigmatic for no reason. Like, yeah. which I, you know, I hate that kind of stuff, but they, yeah. this was a very cursory, like, Hey, look at these numbers, you know, <laughs> it was his lottery, his lotto numbers for the week. <laughs> we find out like, Oh, right. all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, we should add that, you know, Laura Dern, a very young Laura Dern is, is really good in this and as is uh, Treat Williams. Now, this was probably, arguably, the probably a highlight of his career as an actor. He did, a few years before this, he did a great underrated movie called Prince of the City. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. he did uh, a movie, uh, it's a movie about D.B. Cooper. Um, it has a longer title than just D.B. Cooper, but uh, he's the star of that. He uh, He's done he did a bunch of things around the early to mid to late eighties. That was kind of his hot spot. Uh, and he's obviously acted for many years, so he kept working, but I would, I would say this was a big part of his career. Yeah. It, it, I, I completely forgot about Prince of the city, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, I mean, and it's someone like, you know, the name, but if I were to put him to a movie, I wouldn't have, you know, I couldn't, I mean, he, he's right. got like a, a pretty standard, good looking, leading male right and and i don't i i'd have to like look at his career dead dead heat is is a movie that he's in and like you when you have a lot of people who watch 80s action or cop movies 
probably know the poster, but they were, they probably wouldn't really. Oh yeah, that's Treat Williams in the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're looking at you're looking at whoever his co-star is more yeah. often than not. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he. Um, so yeah, we 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 talked about the code and how this is going to be released in January on Criterion. Yeah. And it actually, this was its this week was the thirty fifth uh, anniversary of its theatrical release. I just I just looked it up. It opened on November fifteenth, nineteen eighty five. Uh, the number one movie in America was Once Bitten, that Jim Carrey vampire comedy. Did you ever see that one? I you know what I never did. Uh, it's you don't you don't have to. That might be the next <laughs> challenge. Maybe that's the next challenge. <laughs> Those um those early movies by some of those comic actors, uh, you know, like uh, going overboard with Sandler, like I had never seen that. Yeah. Any. yeah. Um, but uh, one of the one of the other things I wanted to mention, I guess it was towards the end because that was what I put in my notes when the Treat Williams character comes around, the music that's used really sounded like true crime music to me. And so if you're looking at it in terms of the actual murders that took place, it, it was a very eerie score in that moment. I don't know. Like I, I listen to a lot of true crime stuff and watch a lot of true crime documentaries. So that sort of music is always very fresh in my head. And that's immediately what I went to when I saw it, like unsolved mysteries type eerie, eeriness. Yeah. You know. it, there is a lot of, and that's just the, the score itself, right? Cause then there are these, uh, pop song like I, I don't my music knowledge is not really strong. James James Taylor is used prominently yeah in it as yeah. well which, which I which I like you don't hear James yeah. Taylor a lot you know yeah yeah it, it felt important uh it, it felt integral to the movie in a way that I like I'm not that familiar with him uh but it, it felt like it was not just a throw-in I guess like right. it, it does take a part of the the personality of the film I guess yeah so Eric thumbs up or thumbs down I said thumbs up. I said it's worth it's worth checking out. And at the very least, if if you don't dig it, I feel like there's at least you can definitely talk about it and debate things. Right. About it if, if you know, it's it's definitely an interesting movie. At the very least, I was I was interested in it and, and entertained. Yep, yeah, I would go. I would go thumbs up as well. I I I did like it. I I think that the you know this there's there probably could be some fine tuning at times, but overall, I. I liked what Joyce Chopra put out there in terms of looking at the life of a teenage girl and the allegorical or not <laughs> aspect of the conclusion. Yeah. So it is, like you said, it is very much worth talking about. And the artwork really threw me, I have to say, we hadn't talked about this, but when I saw, when I saw the artwork announced by Criterion well before we talked about this movie challenge, I yeah. looked at it and I looked at the title and I looked at the font and I was like, the hell is, it? you know, I was ter really turned off. It almost looks like a, the cover of a trashy romance novel yeah, like, yeah, or something yeah. like that. And so I, when you suggested it, I was like, okay, <laughs> like, definitely... I, that was my initial response, but I'm really glad that I watched it because it's very thought provoking. If nothing else, even if, like you said, even if you don't like it, it, it does get you discussing. So yeah. Yeah. And it, you're even the, it's like pink font. Yeah. It, it feels sort of pulpy and um yeah i mean that in in the in the opening 10 15 minutes of the movie also kind of feels that way you know they're at a beach and they're playing right. hooky and they, and they they're going to get picked up from the mall because that's where they lied about being you know right so it definitely starts out, out that way and yeah smooth talk risky business it all has that same kind of like, <laughs> yeah that kind Very of 80s you know, title um, yeah exactly and it would, like during the first half i kept thinking of the poster and i was like that guy from the poster is not in this at all. Like, like, and, and also, like that, the way they're, they're um, uh, positioned in the poster, I don't think is actually how it is in the movie. Like he's on the no. porch, she walks past him to get in the car, but the way he looks on the poster is not a accurate. I, I, and, but you know, that, that's okay. I have to say that <laughs> yeah. if you were, if you go in expecting that exact shot, you'll, you'll probably be a little disappointed, but you know, even so. <laughs> All right. Well, yes, go check it out uh, when it becomes available um, and let us know what you think. Or if you've seen it already, let us know what you think. So for Eric, my name is Chad. Thank you for joining us.